Hello, hi, welcome to the Tell It Like It Is podcast with Alexi Bailey. I have Andrea with us today. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, like it's a no-brainer. Um, I definitely wanted to talk with you. Um, for a long time, I've been like toying around with the podcast idea and I always wanted to have you on. Uh, one of the things that I always admired about you was your entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you've always like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and like, that's something that you, seriously, like, yeah. I always like that. You know, a, a lot of a lot of us can learn from that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, how have you been? I've been good. I have been adjusting and transitioning and you know, trying to maintain my mental health, my health, my wellness all around. So. So are you a native New Yorker? Yes. So Absolutely. I am born, well, born in Manhattan, raised in Queens, and I moved to Brooklyn for love. Okay. You know, when you're from Queens, you're like, I don't want to move to Brooklyn, but then I moved to Brooklyn and loved it. I met you in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, so where in Queens were you? Uh, Jamaica. I lived in St. Albans for a while. Yeah, Jamaica, St. Albans. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're in North Carolina. Yeah, I moved to North Carolina um, September of 2020. So, you know, the pandemic has... You know, other than, the, I always say this, other than the deaths and, you know, the crazy illnesses and the losses, most people have enjoyed pandemic. Yeah, you know what, I have. And so there's been like high anxiety around a lot of things, but I've enjoyed it so much because I think it's pushed me to force myself into a space of taking care of myself. You know, it's like, what else can you do besides take care of yourself? Like, how can you stop uh, stop worrying? Because there's literally nothing that you can do. Right. How do you stop worrying and how do you just daily take care of yourself in a way that, you know, you're not so, I mean, obviously that stress and that anxiety is, you know, it's there, but you just gotta take it a, a day at a time. So I think that I learned a lot about that um and also just um sorry my dog and my cat are really are fighting at it. yeah they're be doing a lot <laughs> um yeah so it's been very interesting but i i definitely have had a good time i have been out and about during the pandemic yeah how is it in north carolina is it masked up is it very strict is it laid back um is masked up it for me it hasn't been as strict so i was working at a club for maybe like a month and then they shut down the mayor has shut down he sh what shut down did they shut down huh? what month did they shut down um february this year or last year this year well okay so they the club that i was at shut down um mm -hmm. But they were at, I mean, when I got here, they were, the restaurants were open. Um, and, you know, I had, I started bartending after I stopped social work. I started bartending for a while. So when I got here, I, I was bartending and they were open at like, I believe 50% capacity. So they were like going through the night, like 2 a.m.? Um, no. So the mayor shut down alcohol sales at 11 o'clock, but at a restaurant, the restaurant closed before 11, like, you know, so I didn't really have an issue there. We didn't really have an issue there. You know, yeah, I mean, some states like New York have been like everything shut down only, only, um, take out and other places they're like fully open dining you know, masks are off, clubbing, like. Yeah, like Atlanta. Exactly. And it's like two different worlds, you know, a hundred miles from each other. 
Yeah. But you know, this summer, well, last 20 summer, 2020, I was out protesting and, it, you know, masks were a big thing, but everyone was outside. It wasn't, um, you know, and there were, it was not a lot of social distancing. Well, yeah, during the protests, you were pretty much like shoulder to shoulder with people. Right. Um, but I think, I think most people would agree that it, most people felt like it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I have not tested positive for COVID at all. Um, and I just, I kind of find it a little bit strange because the people that I've been around haven't really tested positive for COVID. Um, like as far as like the people I've been around who have been protesting, but like, you know, I don't know. It's, I just, I don't understand it. Honestly, the people who have been like less restrictive have not gotten COVID. And then the people who have been like, you know, trying to stay away have gotten COVID. You know, I hang out with a lot of scientists and they're like, it's science. We don't know. We don't know. And that's the reality. No one knows, you know, the CDC doesn't know. They say right. wear a mask just in case, you know, and it's, it's gotten to a point where some people are like, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to kill myself with a mask on. And why do we have to give up life as it is? And it's dramatic. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> on and on and all of these kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, we all know that the world is going to be different from now on. <laughs> so the world we live in is always going to be a new world. And we just kind of need to like adjust to that, to be honest. But I think what is big for me is just not being anxious around everything. And I think... Were you, you anxious know, about the virus? Um, at first, yeah. At first, I, if I coughed, I was just like, oh my goodness, I need to, I need to check and see if I got, have COVID. Maybe for like the first, so it really started in like March, I want to say. So yeah. maybe like those first two to three months. And then once I realized like my anxiety was really high, I had to check myself. Like, listen, I'm a healthy individual, you know, like, you know, I've barely get sick I don't ever really get sick so I had to kind of like calm my nerves about it yeah. because that you know being stressed out and anxious about it will make you sick <laughs> so you know exactly yeah so I was kind of you, you travel a lot I do mm -hmm. yeah I went to I went to Mexico and <laughs> so there's uh this street called Taco Alley Mm -hmm. and it was New York week in Mexico, New York week or something like that. Yeah. And the street was packed, packed. I mean, like how a club would be packed on like a Saturday night, like bumping into people packed. This street was like that. And people did not have on masks. No one had on masks. So like you had masks people... or were you just like when in Rome? Say it again. Did I wear a mask? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. That particular, you were like one of the few people there with mask on. Yeah, yeah, because I just bring my mask anyway, you know. And you know, at that point, I, we didn't have to get tested to go. We didn't have to get a COVID test to go to Mexico. What month was that? Um, that was in I want to say, oh gosh, September. So that now, was. Looking back on one full year of COVID, do you think? like you're overreacting we were overreacting or no absolutely not the number of deaths proves that we were not overreacting at all i just think for me anyway it's just personal around like maintaining my mental health you know um so whatever people need to do to protect themselves that's what they need to do you know yeah but for me my mental health is really really important and making sure that i'm not anxious about everything that I do, you know, even, well, I went to Jamaica, I went to Jamaica in, uh, around Valentine's day. And in order to go to Jamaica, I had to have a COVID test done. That was my very first COVID test. Yeah. And, you, and I had to say it again. You turned in your results at the airport or. Yeah. You're giving your results at the airport. And I have this, I have, um anxiety around like needles and like touching my face and stuff 
Um, so I got the COVID test to go, which wasn't so bad. You know, it was like a cotton swab on the tip of your nose. And then in, in Jamaica, like they are very restrictive. Like you have to, you can't walk into a place without sanitizing your hands. I think they have not the, not, I went to Montego Bay. So not in the area that I went, but, um, I was watching a video of a girl. She said that there's an app, the state has an app mm -hmm. and, um, it, follows your location and every morning you have to take your temperature um right so it just tracks you while you're in jamaica so this was an app for tourists or yeah i believe it's for tourists yeah but i didn't have to go through that but that was something that i you know i was watching because i wanted to find out like what the what it would be like being in jamaica you know while i was there you know and that was something that she said that she went through they had to pretty much monitor her every single day and it was kind of the same, but I stayed on the resort. I stayed on the resort and they check your temperature every morning. You know, you have to sanitize your hands before you walk into any of the restaurants, any of the places, you know, so they're very like big on that. Um, what was the name of the resort? Rio Palace. Okay. All right. Go Bay. Yeah, it was a really nice resort. Really nice resort. Um, I had a good time. <laughs> COVID and all, I had a good time. Listen, you still gotta live your life, I think. Right, for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So I feel like, you know, I think for me, 2020 and the George Floyd um, thing that happened, it really brought me in touch with my blackness in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I think for a long time, I kind of felt like, obviously, I'm Black, and I know it, and I feel Black, no problem. But, you know, raising my Black boys, I really try to not focus on color. Like, oh, you're Black, Black this, that, you know, I just try to raise them as American, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think something kind of happened. It was like, it was like this reminder, like, yeah, like, don't forget, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. I think, so for me, I've had conversations with Kai around, like, his experience and what it would be like, you know? Um, because Kai's dad had it several times for no reason. I mean, like, and this is in North Carolina, you know, when we were in college, like he would, one time he was in the back of his car, like he w went outside. We live, we live over here. The parking lot is here. He's in his car. Like I can literally look out the window and see him. He's in the trunk of his car and the police pull up on him and said, somebody called the cops because he looked, you know, suspicious. Um, and they arrested him and he went to jail. <laughs> so, um, there have been a lot of experiences that I've, as a, a third party have witnessed, you know, and even though it, it didn't happen directly to me, it was still traumatizing to me. Absolutely. Cause yeah. it could have been you. Um, say it again. It could have been you. Yeah, right, exactly. And you know, it, it, it didn't happen to me, but it, it also affected me. So I've, I've always been very big on, you know, telling him like, listen, this is the reality. You know, I don't want him to be anxious about it, but I also want him to know that these are the, this is- What do you tell him? Um, I just let him know that like, you don't trust anyone, you know? You don't trust anyone, you don't give a lot of information. You know, like letting him know if a cop comes, you are not to talk to any police officer because you are without your parents. If anything were to ever happen, you know, you don't talk to a police officer without your parents. You don't let, allow them to to put fear in your heart, you know, like, um, and we just have conversations about like things that happen, Trayvon Martin, George, like, you know, and I check in with him about how he feels about it, you know, right. um, and just kind of like giving him the realities and also trying to empower him and let him know that like, there's a reason why, that why, you know, people fear you, you know, like there's, there's something very special about you. There's something very powerful about you that causes fear 
in someone who is not like you or who doesn't even know you, but doesn't like you, you know? Um, so those are the conversations we do have. But for me, I think what I had to learn is like my fear, I can't put it on him. You know, like I can't uh, transfer my fears onto him. And I have to be very mindful about how I'm saying things to him so that he's not moving out of a space of, you know, anxiety. Right. You know, like, yes, I want him to protect himself, but I also don't want him to like, you know, always feel like a victim. Do you tell him to avoid anything like saying, hanging out, you know, dressing a certain way? Do you advise him to? No, no, I'm also big on respecting black culture and not um, treating black culture as if it's not okay. So as far as like music that he wants to, I mean, for he's 13. So there are certain things I don't let him listen to just because the content is really graphic or, you know, but it's not necessarily like you should be ashamed of this culture. It's just not appropriate. You know, <laughs> some things are just not appropriate. Um, but no, I'm, I allow him to kind of like move freely and be creative how he wants to be creative. Um, and I do my best to, to be mindful of shaming any type of culture. You know, I try to make sure that he doesn't feel shame for things that he's interested in. See, so on, on my side, like, I feel like I love hip hop. So like up until like my kids were able to understand the music, I played whatever I wanted. And like the minute they started being able to comprehend stuff, I just like shut down like, mm -hmm. like pretty much all hip hop that I, that I listened to. And I would only listen to it like if they weren't around or that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the average black movie, like they don't really see me watching like black movies like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about leading up to this George Floyd thing. We were just, you know, you, 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 you watch the kids movies, you know what I mean? So the family kids movies. So it wasn't like, a, oh, we're watching black movies or, oh, we're not watching. We just watched. So I, I, I felt like I got to a point where, you know, obviously we live in, we live in Princeton now and Princeton's very, um, Eurocentric and more, you know, the African Americans, I would say in Princeton are very much subdued, I would say, for the most part. And you kind of don't want to be the one to stand out and, and kind of be that, you kind of want to blend in with everyone, you know? Okay. And I think, I think we would do that naturally, but I think there's a natural stigma that you carry as a black person that you just, you know, you, you want to, try to fit in even more and just trying to play play their game so to speak you know mm -hmm. um so i think you know when when so since george floyd happened i really like started taking in things more like they're older now yeah they're older now so my youngest is turning 10 you know mm -hmm. so i don't it's not it's not a lack of pride or, you know, any, anything like that. And I, and, I, and I was even saying the conversation is, you know, we've been through so much as a culture that there's a reason why the music sounds the way it does. There's a reason why the, the language and the, the topics are the way they are. And I think the more you kind of, this is not appropriate, not not saying you, but just me in general, I'm looking at me and I'm like, no, you gotta, you have to understand why this is the way it is. And right. it, the more I try to keep them away from this because it's inappropriate, this because of that, I find that the, it, the, the field begins to get narrower and narrower. And it's like, all right, there's only two things you can. Right, do I appreciate the culture behind this or do I censor it because, you know, it's always inappropriate. Yeah, absolutely. For me, like, so with Kai, I make sure like he knows classics like Nas or, you know, like Jay-Z or, you know, like I try to put, put um, you know, teach him a little bit about that. Um, Lauren Hill. 
So I give him like a little bit of like before hip hop was, um, when hip hop was storytelling a little bit, you know? Not that hip hop is not storytelling now because it is, um, but I think there's also um, more of an aspect of like just flaunting or just boasting that's hip hop now, which is cool too, you know? Because I think that, I think that that's important too, you know? feeling confident, you know, like having music that makes you feel powerful. I think that's very important. Um, but before music was that, and you know what, the music now that he listens to, I don't know the artist's name, but there's a lot of like singing in his music. And I think it's not 6 9 it's, um, he died. He's a rapper that just- um, Pop Smoke? Not Pop Smoke. Um, um, I don't know, but his music was very like emotional. Yeah, I'm trying to think of his name, but yeah, yeah, I think I know who you're talking about. He's a young kid, and um, and that's who my son likes to listen to. He likes to listen to very like moody, dramatic hip hop. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like emo hip hop. Right. Yeah. I so when he, like your kids are playing artists that you don't know, and you're like, who is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're listening. I feel like my parents when I'm like, this is what you listen to. <laughs> like, it sounds really drab and like sad, you know, but it's what he likes. It's what he's into, you know, and I think um, it allows him to relate to something. It allows him to kind of like, you know, I'm feeling moody. So this is what, you know, I'm going to just, he, yeah, so and I think that movie is uh, that that type of music isn't as raunchy, you know. Yeah. It's like the yeah. sexual content isn't as much. Yeah. As, but that's what he listens to. That's what he listens to. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of funny how um, how like my kids they don't like they they don't even know Jay Z. Like they, they don't. Know. So that's important for me is that he knows the classics. Like I've taken him to Lauren Hill concert. Like I take him to concerts just so that he is not lost. Like, oh, who is this person? Like I try to make sure he's well-rounded in like music, <laughs> music, movies. I try to make sure like he knows the classics, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely feel the same way. But like I said, for a long time, I was like, you're too young or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think- I think At what age did you accept cursing because, or like sexual content? Because I'm still like, close your eyes. <laughs> Even though I, I do want him to, like I was saying earlier about the Grand Army uh, show on Netflix. Yeah. Um, I do want him to get like the content as far as, you know, like the storyline and like seeing real life situations. Like there are situations, like um, there's an episode about a girl that was raped. And she wasn't necessarily raped in the way that everyone thinks of rape, like, which is like pinning down penetration, yeah. you know, and she was drunk and she was kind of like, um, she didn't say no, she, you know, but she, she, she didn't give consent. She didn't, yeah, she didn't give consent, which I think is very powerful. And I think is important for them to know, you know, like, what is okay and what's not okay like what looks like rape like what is ju not just your idea of rape but what is it really right. so i thought it was powerful but watching it i'm also like my baby like i don't really want him seeing this right. you know it's very graphic um but i think it's also important as a 13 year old boy especially a black boy um to watch things like that because often they're like persecuted for things that they don't really know. Right. I think, you know, one of the things is that like, I'm in a space where everything is all about academics. And mm -hmm. like, I can teach them about music, movies and all these things like all day. And like, I want them to be strong and academic. So like, I feel like if, if, if I'm show if I show you five movies and I'm not showing you five books, then I'm like, you know, I'm telling you that academics is not as important. So that's another reason why I kind of like go to bed early, you know, wake up. And even though I'm not like, 
you know, pushing this or pushing that book with them, I, I just, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable saying, oh, let's watch this movie. Let's watch this movie. Listen to this. Listen to this. So that's also been the other side of it. I think I probably should be, I probably would like to be stronger with like black authors and these kinds of things, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 it's complicated because when they do get a chance to watch something, I find that, you know, there's an oversaturation. Mm -hmm. so it's like unavoidable so you yeah. might as well watch it with them and put them on to stuff yeah yeah I think for well I'm big on like balancing that I want him to be able because as you're big on academics I'm big on like creativity and like um him knowing all sides of a uh like just learning as much as possible in different ways, you know? Like, I feel like from these shows that I'm watching with him, you mm -hmm. know, there's a lot that he can learn. And I'm always asking him his, uh, his perspective on things and like for him to kind of like analyze and kind of like, you know, give me his opinion and kind of like be constructive in the way that he's thinking about things, right. you know? Because if he gives me, if he gives me one perspective, I'm always going to, play devil's advocate and give him another perspective. You know, even if I agree with his perspective on something, I'm always gonna uh, ask him questions from another point of view. So I think that's really big for me. Um, but you know, Kai is, as far as books, he loves to read. He loves to read, but his thing is graphic novels. Okay, yeah, yeah. He loves graphic novels, loves still to this day, you know, he's big on graphic novels. And, you know, Success Academy is big on, like, you need to read chapter books, you need to read all the time. Yeah. Um, so he definitely has, uh, is, like, very, he has that, like, in his arsenal, like, yes, he can read, he can, you know, um, he can understand a book very well, but I think what he likes more is art, the, the, art behind books and things like that, which is fine. Yeah, I mean, I think that's equally important. You, you yeah. mentioned Success Academy. How many years were you there? Since he was in kindergarten, from kindergarten to sixth grade. And what was your experience? Um, so I think I have a lot of mom guilt around Success Academy because I think that academically, they're top tier, but I think culturally they're not. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of not allowing because Kai is, and I've always taught him to be a free thinker. I've always taught him to be creative. I've always, you know, taught him to kind of just be himself, you know? And I think that they don't allow a lot of room for that. They call it being goofy, you know, like they're very strict in a lot of ways. And they, and I don't think they gave him the space. They used to call him the mayor because he would be in class and he would kind of like lead the class in whatever direction, you know, like he would tell jokes. He wants to, his, actually he wants to be a comedian. Like he's like, um, yeah, his, um, his idol is Kevin Hart. Um, so he wants to be like Kevin Hart. And I think that they didn't allow room for that because, you know, it's more like. Yeah, academic. Yeah, academic, which is important. But also, I think a school setting needs to foster creativity. And I don't think that they did that uh, in a way like it just wasn't a good fit for him. And I think I kept him there for so long because of the academics, because, you know, the public schools, where else would I put him, you know? Like even in the school right now that he's in, he's like flying by like it's nothing, <laughs> you know. Like he's like, oh, this is easy, you know. Um, so because I think uh, Success Academy is like two years ahead of like regular public schools, you know. So that was a big thing. It was like kind of trying to balance. Like I do want him to have this academic. So for me. Um, I tried to balance that by giving him the creativity outside of school. Right. He was having trouble with that in school because, you know, he's like, I'm just being me. Like, I just want to do me, you know? Like, I'm in class and I'm just 
you know, I made a joke because I thought it was funny. I laughed because I thought it was funny, you know? I mean, I've been through it all, so I know exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in Success Academy as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Daylin started in grade one. And when we left Success, when we left New York, he was halfway through grade five. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after grade five, you go into, no, grade five, you go into the middle school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he was halfway through that. And when we came to Princeton, he kind of had this, like, I got this and like, you know, he, you know, I think it was, I think there was a step down in the pace and the expectation and the, you're like under a microscope in, in success. Yeah. Which is a good recipe to keep people on task. And I, yeah. think, I think at first he, it was a tough adjustment for him. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one thing I would say about success is if you start success, and and you're a it, it's better if you can stay in success because yeah. like leaving success halfway you kind of you know you need you, it's lost in translation it's like exactly. what do I do now you know <laughs> yeah yeah and um, same thing if you've been somewhere don't come I wouldn't say come to success like seventh eighth grade because now if you've been there from the beginning you're kind of used to it and now right. you're jumping in you're like a fish out of water kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So overall, I always say good things about success because like you said, there's not a lot of other good options in public school. Mm -hmm. And I try to explain that to people. And a lot of people don't know what's really going on in the, in the public school system. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, doing social work, I was always in the schools you know, always talking to guidance counselors. And sometimes these guidance counselors don't even know the students. They don't know anything about the students. 300 students. Yeah, and you know, and these are students that are like high risk, you know, living in shelters and they would not know what their grades were. They wouldn't, sometimes they wouldn't even see them regularly, you know, so I know, um, that I did not want him in public school. There's actually a school that I was trying to transition him to. Um, and the reason why he did move with his dad is because he didn't get scholarship to get into this school, but it's called Brooklyn Free School. And it's like a democratic school. Mm -hmm. So the kids actually uh, choose what they wanna learn. Okay. So, um, so the school, like they have classes. So the kids make up the classes. So for example, a kid is like, hey, I want to build a fort. I want to learn how to build a fort, right? That becomes a class. Okay. They find um, some type of expert outside and, you know, they'll teach them how to build a fort, you know. A charter school or private school or what? Private school. Yeah. It's a private school. And they'll teach them, like, how to build a fort. They'll bring somebody in. Um, they have, like, mathematics and things like that. But you, pr you pretty much electives. interested in Right. I mean, the reality is most people, you know, unless you have a lot of money, a, a private school is not an option. Yeah, I think the tuition was like $30,000 for a high school, middle school experience, it's like $30,000, you know. And they do have options for, um, for um, what is it called? That's um, the word I'm... Yeah, for like scholarships or... Um, Um, like um, raise the scale. Yeah, sliding scale. Sliding scale fees, yes. Um, they have options for that, but um, they didn't have that option that year. So it's based on like, so they might have 10 students who pay full, like full tuition and their full tuition will help pay other students. Right. Tuition. So it's kind of like it balances out, but he wasn't able to get in. It, listen, the education system, I don't know. I, so what, what are the main goals that I want to do with the podcast? Like, I, I like, I like social and I'm just like, I'm okay with social stuff, but I feel like there's some real issues that need attention. And at this point, everyone knows what the issues are. So mm -hmm. it's this kind of weird kind of thing where it's like, oh yeah, we know what the issues are, but what can we do? 
Yeah, I know. And I think that we're, now we're like pushing to create big change, like things that people are like, why would I do that? Like, you know, um, do you feel like we're heading a direction of change? Um, I think that a lot more people are opening their eyes and, and um, not just opening their eyes, but also being like, okay, we know that this is happening and okay, uh, like with George Floyd, it's like the man, although we've seen people be murdered on camera, right? We've seen black folks be murdered on camera. I think the way in which it happened, um, the manner in which it happened and the fact that everyone was at home and everyone was paying attention, there's no way that you can ignore it. You know, there's no way. And I think that happens a lot is like, people are like, another thing has happened. You know, another thing has happened and they start to feel almost like hopeless. Yeah. And I think with, George Floyd, it was like, oh, hell no. Nah. You know, like we need to, there has to be some sort of change, you know? And I think that happened at a pivotal time. Like the timing was just, uh, it was, it was just a, a crazy timeline of like when it happened and how it happened. So yeah, I think- I totally agree. Everyone, everyone's energy was pent up from the pandemic being being caught off guard by the pandemic, you know, there's been a number of other deaths leading up to that. Plus we had Trump who like had rubbed everyone the wrong way and the weather had just started to get nice. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like, like not, not on high definition, not like, it was like six feet away, you know, you yeah, could hear yeah. his last breath. It was, it right. was very intense. It was, it was, and uh, I think people could feel it. So a lot of people, I know a lot of people who have like been able to ignore, been able to be like, be like well, I don't say anything because, you know, I, you know, it's just, it, like you said, I don't raise my sons like uh, to focus on their blackness. But I think in that moment, there's nothing else that you can do but think like that could be me as like that could be my kid you know that could be so i think people saw themselves in that situation that it could be anybody you know that could really be you i think people separate a lot and that's that's obvious for obvious reasons like you know to maintain their mental health to maintain you know like kind of desensitize so where do you think we're going? You said you feel like change is happening. What do you see happening? Um, so I know that in New York, a lot of the laws have changed around like, you know, what can happen during an arrest. Um, the chokehold laws have changed. A lot of that have happened, have happened but one of the things um, that was huge was like defunding the NYPD, right? Um, and did that happen? Um, no. So it happened, but you know how things happen. You know, I think that it was more of a pacification. So it's like, okay, we're taking this amount of money away from like their upfront budget, but it, it still comes in on the back end kind of thing. Right, right. So that's really what happened is like, it, they kind of defunded the police, but not really, you know? Um, so- I, I hate to say it, but I, I don't feel like we're heading in a, a real direction of change, you know? Like, I think a lot of pacifying they, happening. They, they paint your, they paint Black Lives Matter on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, these companies start using more, like my wife got an Apple Watch and the Apple Watch was like, black green and red for like oh, yeah yeah it's a lot of marketing it's listen like, it's marketing like, listen. yes it's like listen the black folks are no longer going to spend their money with us so let's let's pretend that we support them but then still pay uh our black workers a lot less than our white workers let's still you know like we're still not paying the sufficient salary or like a living wage to these kids, you know, like it's a lot of like, like I said, pacification happening. 
a lot of pacification happening. There's a lot of people hiring, um, hiring um, specialists. Yeah, specialists to come in, culture. And it's like, okay, well, that's fine. Just make sure you're getting paid. <laughs> Just make sure you're getting paid. Like, if you're going to pretend, you know, come out of the pocket, you know? <laughs> so, with that said, do you feel like change is happening? Um, I do in certain ways, but I think in the long run, we're going to end up being back in a situation where we have to, I think we have a long journey by far, you know, I feel like they're going to, I feel like these laws have been put in place before, you know, like there are laws and restrictions around what you can do when you arrest a person. They do not care. (laughs) <laughs> like there's always a loophole so it's like we're changing the laws but the the the, issue, the laws are being broken every day every day so it's not the laws that need to change it's not you know it's not um so i was reading somewhere that they're going to um create a a system where the commissioner i believe of police is chosen by uh, the city that they're in or like the state that they're in. Okay. I was just reading that the other day. I didn't, um, I didn't have a chance to actually like get into it completely, but I think that that is a good idea that, you know, um, the people get to choose the head of the police department, you know? I think that would be helpful. You know, when I when I think back to the 1960s and what Malcolm X was saying about fighting for desegregation and so we can go to the same schools and be in the same theater and all of these things that we were fighting for or hoping would make things better, like from that perspective, I think things were better the way they were, you know? Right. Absolutely. But I think um, capitalism (laughs) has happened and it's like um, the government understands like, oh, no, we need to make money off of like, okay, like let's uh, desegregate because we're obviously going to make more money if they're coming into our establishments. They're going to spend their money with us. That's the thing, you know, and and I, I get in, I, I, I feel very strongly about it because if you think about something like the Negro League, mm-hmm. you know, imagine if we still had the Negro League today. Absolutely, absolutely. No one would watch the NFL or the NBA. Mm-hmm. It would be right. like. Absolutely. You know, right. Absolutely, I agree. I so, agree. So, the re- I mean, if, if you ask me, I, I haven't done research on it, but probably white people own the Negro League also. But the point that I'm trying to make is we would have been fine if we stayed separate, you know, and se- we, we integrated, but integrated means you, we weren't integrating on the same level. We were integrated. Oh, right. There's a hierarchy. Absolutely. And I think everything from in schools, even one of the things I was talking about uh, is ACS. The system of ACS is racist. Like everything from the foods that we eat, mm. the access to the foods that we eat, to our education, to the healthcare, everything is built on a racist system. On a and and there is no way to completely change that, but to dismantle the whole thing and start all over again. You know, and it's like, how do we do that? How is that even possible? Uh, that we just, you know start all over again, you know, because there's, I mean, I lived in East New York. I can't, I I don't even have access to like organic foods. Um, You know, I don't eat meat, vegan foods, extremely difficult to find, you know, like certain products, certain foods, you know, in my community. And it's like, they have McDonald's on every corner. They have liquor stores on every corner. They have, you know, like unhealthy KFCs, unhealthy food everywhere, you know? And it's like, we get accustomed to eating that instead of taking care of ourselves. Even down to like, 
I was um, listening to a podcast and they were talking about how black folks never, never want to go outdoors. And, you know, anytime you look at, at some type of advertising for like outdoors, it's only white people, mm. you know, like how important is it for us to be outdoors? Like how is important is it for us to learn nature and to be in nature and like our wellness is part of our, part of being well is being outside and being in nature, you know, that's super important, but we don't even get that. We don't get that. Um, and they don't market to us, right. you know, they don't market to us and being in social work and being in the projects all the time, like project housing, they don't have lights in the living room. They don't have lights in the bedroom. Like how important is it to have lighting? Right. You know, I like to have lighting. The, the hallways are dark brown. You know, it always smells like urine. And it's like growing up in that environment is depressing. It's traumatic in and of itself. Waking up can be traumatic. It's like, dang, I, I'm waking up. I don't even have real light. You know, <laughs> I don't even have that. So I think from just everything, you know, I, everything. I think like I, I've found in general that most one of so I've, I've found in general that I've had a lot of conversations where people agree on the system on the system being broken people mm -hmm. are aware of what the problems are and how bad it is and these kinds of things and not everyone I mean people who are most affected by it we know so mm -hmm. my my question is what are we going to do like what can we do Right, and so for me, I advocate, I like as you can see like on my social media, I'm very big on wellness, very big on, so for me, my population is talking to people who look like me, like black women, um, because I think as a black woman who raise children, a lot of the times not um, dismissing black men from raising black children, because obviously that happens a lot, but just as a black woman birthing um, black children um, and nurturing them from very young, I'm big on like, what are you eating? You know, like a lot of like self care, self management, you know, and what that actually looks like. I think a lot of people talk about it like, oh yeah, take care of yourself, self care, you know, go get your nails done, go get your hair done, things like that. And I don't think a lot of people think of self-care as in like doing the basics, <laughs> which is like going to know, sleep. setting a goal, taking care, you know, paying your bills on time and self-care, you know, saying no when you want to say no, you know, saying yes when things feel good, you know, just like the smallest things can be self-care. So that's, kind of like how I advocate. And during the process, um, I created like a Zoom chat for people to kind of like just vent because it was so, uh, just on social media, you can feel the energy being so heavy um, around that time, around the time of George Floyd, you know, um, around the time of Ahmaud Aubrey. So I felt like creating a space where we're not on social media you know, we don't have like our our white friends or our white counterparts looking at what we're venting because I think sometimes we filter that too. Like we want to vent and be completely honest, but we can't completely be honest because, you know, our bosses are watching or like, you know, mix, we're in mixed company. Right. So um, that was a big thing for me is to create like a space where we could just talk our talk our thing you know like however you feel you can just say it you know what kind of responses did you get um actually it was really good I think I had about like 15 people and we were on there for hours and we were just kind of like going through it like being support for each other um you know a lot of people gave um created spaces like I'll come I like I'll cook for you or, you know, like if you need me, just call me. So I think that um, it just created a, a space for us to be supportive, completely supportive and just like vent. Um, and one of the things, I tried to get an all men's group together, but I think, but that uh, wasn't as successful um, because, you know, I'm not really connected to 
a huge group of men. Um, yeah, but I think it was important because we don't allow men's space to be vulnerable, you know, and it, they don't allow themselves space to be vulnerable. And I think in that situation, in this situation, just watching this man die and them being, uh, it could all, it being like, kind of like their space, their, their face, um, it was very traumatic. And like, they don't have a space to cry or to, you know, just really, really express themselves and emote where they can feel comfortable, you know? So I, I wanted to create that, but I didn't, um, it ended up being women, <laughs> a lot more women. And I don't think that men always feel comfortable expressing themselves in front of women. Right. Yeah, so um, that wasn't as successful, but I would love to even, to, you know, try, I would still try again if there was, you know, an avenue for me to do that. Even if I wasn't necessarily involved, um, you know, you, you would um, advertise it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so what are we gonna do? Like, what what are we gonna do? Because we're, we're, we're still in the midst of something here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to do like my part as far as like, you know, creating spaces for people. I think, I think, I think most people, and I'm generalizing, I think most people, you know, do well taking care of themselves and their immediate family, you know, trying mm -hmm. to support the people they know. And I do think that that is the first step, right? Make mm -hmm. sure you're supporting the people who you know around you. One of the, one of the people who, who I think about sometimes is there's a crossing guard, you know, right, right in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are easily to be nice, you know, hi, how you doing, Mr. Russell? You know, but there's no, I think there can be more of a real community, you know, right. real community outside of your immediate family and immediate circle. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm trying to do with this space, like you said, is to create a space where people can vent and also put our intention out to have more in-person connection and expanding outward and with a real intent of fostering community in a real way. Because yeah. I, think, I think, you know, back when we had segregation, we had more real community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right. But then that was broken up <laughs> and um, I think when we have community now, um, a lot of times it turns into something negative. Sometimes it turns into things that are negative. And I think because we are coming from a place of lack, you know? You um, an example, what do you mean? Well, for example, like the projects, you know, where there, there's an opportunity for community. Like you're in a space with people who look like you, who have the same culture as you, but because you're always in a state of survival, um, I don't think that you're able, I don't think that um, we're able to flourish, you know, and support each other in a, in a way that we grow because everything is about lack. Everything is about asking someone for assistance, the person with in power for assistance and, you know, or just getting, just getting your basic needs met, you know? So I think sometimes uh, we miss out on opportunities to flourish because it's more about just survival. Um, and it, I know that like the New York State um, public system, public assistance system is one of the better systems um, as far as access to resources. But the way that things happen uh, in the New York State public assistance system is like, the more you try to do better, the harder it is for you to do better. You know, it's, it's difficult for you to, um, so if you get a job, you have to be making, soon as you get a job, they cut your assistance. You know, they don't really give you time to get on your feet. And even if you're making, first of all, minimum wage 
absolutely, absolutely ridiculous for New York. So it's like, you can't really get on your feet. Um, so I think us building, creating spaces where we have more access to things, more access to support and uh, assistance is very helpful. I think that people are creating those spaces now. Um, I am often in a world of like creatives, um, people who own black owned businesses and just we've been in spaces of like supporting each other and like, yes, I might have to pay $60 for a t-shirt, but I'm going to pay it. Like people are now saying yes, because they understand how important black economics is, black wealth is. So I think that that's a huge thing and a huge factor in us making progress is like supporting black owned businesses and getting the black dollar to circulate. That's an important one. That's a, that's a really important one. Um, I, I, that's a, a great point, you know, us creating businesses and supporting it that mm -hmm. can really help get the ball going more in that particular di direction. What yeah. One of the things that we're going to be doing going forward is I'm going to be doing like panels. Okay. And um, connecting people who have, you know, different, different niches, putting the niches together so that we can strategize and, you know, come together, you know, like a Voltron kind of thing. I think that's really important. I think it's really, really important. Um, because the more we connect and the more that we do develop uh, our economic system, I think the easier it is for us to afford each other. <laughs> right. You know, the more, the more money that we do have, the easier it is for us to run our businesses. And one of the things for me as to why I decided, so when I did quit social work, I decided I'm gonna be a full-time entrepreneur, entrepreneur, right? And one of the thought processes was like, I no longer wanna work for anyone who's white. Like I no longer want to do that. And it's really because I, like in social work, it's like, who's giving you these rules and regulations on how to treat your people, right? Like I'm, working with families who look like me, you know, and I'm looking at my boss who has no idea what it's like to be black. And they're telling me, oh, well, this family should just do this. This family should just do that. And they shouldn't be talking to their children like this. And they shouldn't, you know, and I no longer ever want to deal with another black person. I never want to deal with someone under the premise of how someone else wants me, how someone who is not of that culture wants me to deal with them. So um, that was like a big thing as to why I decided like, I wanna be an entrepreneur. I wanna be an entrepreneur because how I deal. And uh, also during that transition, I was like, how can I also counsel people? You know, like how can I do things that like I've been doing normally because right, I, I have my bachelor's, I don't have, uh, my master's. So I wouldn't be able to actually um, provide, well, I would be able to provide mental health services, but I wouldn't be able to provide therapy legally, you know? Um, so that's- You can do those things. You just won't have the state license to collect insurance. Right. But, right, exactly, exactly. And also like legally, you know, like there are ramifications. You can do, you can do counseling. Yes, right. So one of the- Pretending I to be- um, license, you can do all the counseling you want. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, once I realized that that is possible for me to create my own space, you know, which was um, the Black Decompression Session, which are the, um, all the Zoom chats where everyone can come and kind of like vent and stuff. Um, once I realized that I can do that, I no longer was attached to the idea of like, okay, I have to have these certain licenses and I have to go through these avenues. And I think once we realize that we don't need these things to create our community and to do for each other, right. um, we're going to be okay. <laughs> we're going to be fine. What's the black community like in North Carolina that you've experienced so far? Um, so I've just been working. <laughs> I've been working. I haven't been outside. Stop um, it. 
I have. I've just been working. I haven't, I haven't, and going back and forth, um, trying to just transition and get everything together. So I haven't really. Um, you, see, you must have seen something. I haven't really experienced the culture. So out here, I do several things. So I drive Uber. Okay. Uh, I waitress and um, I do graphic design. So I do branding for businesses. Um, and also I have like a lingerie, I have a lingerie line. So I've just kind of been trying to like get, get yeah, yeah. Just kind of like get settled, get a routine going. Um, so I haven't met anybody, you know, and actually my sister moved out of the state. So are you in a black neighborhood? Um, so I live in the university area. It's, uh, where it's like a lot of college students yeah. and there is a Indian population here. Okay. A lot, of, um, a lot of Indians. So I don't know, I haven't, you know, I haven't really met my neighbors really, you know, I say hello, you know, gotcha. I've been myself, but I haven't really like created those relationships just yet. Well, I have a best friend who lives down in North Carolina. He's near Raleigh. Oh, that's, yeah, that's far. That's like two and a half hours from here. I promised him a visit. So yeah. it's been too long. I haven't seen him in like 15 years. And, you know, we both got kids and we're all over the place. So Adulting, yeah, yeah I, have, I, I, I do. I want to see him. So I'll be coming down that way at some point. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. out, of my, out of here all the time. So we'll see. Well, you're always welcome to come. You know, Charlotte is two and a half hours from Raleigh, but we're here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Kai yeah. will be here during summers, you okay. know, and holidays and things like that. Um, he should be here for spring break coming up at the end of the month. Yeah. So Harvey, I definitely want to. I like I like the um, what is it? The black session. <laughs> the black decompression. I like that. I like that. It has a nice ring to it. Thank you. Yes, I definitely want to collaborate with you going forward. Um, not just conversations, but um, planning sessions that lead to action. Yeah. Okay. You know, that's definitely what I'm thinking. And I, I want this to be something I want to be a part of the black network, you know, and I want, I want, I think if you ask me, what my biggest dream would be to one day so people can all say, okay, I know there's one place where I can go, where I can go and pitch this idea. And um, I know enough people are going to see it where if they like it, they'll send their money in and we can do projects and we can be, mm -hmm. you know, like where, where does that exist right now? Um, so it as far being completely black yeah right but it's it's more rhetorical i'm more saying like i feel like we should we we need more spaces like that you know absolutely absolutely, absolutely. you know um i know i know that there's a huge black world out there and i think you know there's we need more what yeah there's a place for you and i think a, a lot more black men um uh, plugging in is important because to be honest black women we have been at like we've been holding it down, you know, <laughs> we've been like, we're going to show up. We're going to show up regardless. I don't care who it, I'm. Yes. I'm fighting for the black man every day of my life. I'm fighting for my brother, my son, my husband, whatever, like we show up. So I think now a lot of black men are like plugged in, like, okay, I'm going to show up too, you know? So it's important. So even though like whatever your experiences as a black man may look different, like there is a space for you and for people who have that same experience as you, you know, for black men who have that same experience as you to kind of like plug into your network. So I think it's awesome what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm just trying to, you know, get my feet wet and not get ahead of myself. And, you know, like you said, you know, one step at a time. Yeah, well, I'm always down. Um, I'm here, I'm always down. Just let me know where you need me. I will jump in. I'm always willing to lend a hand. Uh, if you need me to, you know, um, 
promote if you need me to help you as far as like graphic designing is concerned. Okay. I'm here. If you need uh, a part of my network, I'm here. I am here. All right. We'll definitely be in contact. Um, and we'll definitely have more conversations in the future, okay? Okay. Yeah. Anything you want to leave our viewers with? Um, no, but I would like to do this again. You will. I would like to do this again. Um, yeah. Yeah, we will. And if there's any questions that you have. We will. We're definitely planned and um, we'll do some moves and I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you for coming on today and um, I'll be seeing you soon. Yes. All right. All right, bye.